I am Connor Benedict, and I'm just here to host the space. Um, I am the Open Culture Coordinator with CC, um, and this is a session from one of our working groups. The session is on the global harmonization of user rights approaches towards an international instrument. So I'm sure we're going to get a bit more insight into what that means and what this is all about in a second. Um, but the working group is part of last year's Open Culture Platform, which was a series of different working groups. And this one has been on um, copyright reform. That was kind of the headline of this um, working group. So I will hand it over to the group and share the um, CC code of conduct in the chat. If you have any questions for me, feel free to message me directly in the chat. Otherwise, I will hand it over to the group. Thank you. Um, I will just also extend a warm welcome to all the participants. So my name is Bridget Vizna, and I'm Director of Policy and Open Culture at Creative Commons. It's a great honor to have uh, this working group of the uh, Creative Commons Copyright Platform present the results of um, a good year of work. Um, this working group was focused on user rights, and this is the, the second output of this group. Um, as Connor mentioned, the global harmonization of user rights approaches towards an international instrument. So um, my warm congratulations to the whole group and specifically to Andre Huang from CC Brazil, who has been leading this group um, over the past few months, um, but also uh, all the all the members and more specifically Deborah De Angelis and uh, Laura Singh Migalia from CC Italy and Jennifer Serki from Simon Fraser University. So after the presentation from the group, I think we'll open up for a Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to share them in the chat or keep them for the end for the uh, the discussion part of this webinar. So over to Andre, the lead of the working group. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Connor, and thank you, Brigitte, for the introduction. The goal for this webinar, as they already mentioned, is to present and discuss the result of the activities of the working group on user rights of Creative Commons corporate platform. The working group uh, started its activities in 2021 as one of four global working groups established by the corporate platform of Creative Commons. Uh, in 2021, we analyzed different user rights and what should copyright laws aim for protecting these rights. And for 2022, we decided to focus on the subject of a global harmonization of user rights uh, and the pros and cons of different copyright systems to such harmonization. Uh, as such, we produced a position paper which can be accessed in CC's Medium page. It has already been published. Uh, the idea for the position paper is to present some ideas and some insights on the topic of user rights in a way that is accessible to and useful to the public, both to copyright experts and also to non-copyright experts. Uh, we should likely start by explaining a little bit of the adoption of this terminology user rights. Uh, we adopt this expression because we believe that user rights are an integral part of copyright, even though they are traditionally referred to as exceptions and limitations. Uh, in our position paper and in this webinar, we choose to use the term uh, exceptions and limitations to refer to the specific user rights, user rights systems usually adopted in civil law countries. Uh, despite being an integral part of copyright, user rights uh, still vary considerably between jurisdictions. And we believe as a working group that there is a growing need for a global harmonization of user rights, especially due to the expanding online and trans-border use of copyrighted works. Despite this, global, this growing importance, the only currently global instrument for the harmonization of user rights is the three-step test, established in the Berne Convention, which is the main convention for copyright globally, uh, the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works. But this two-step test presents three requirements to assess whether the use of a copyrighted work is to be considered legitimate, 
The first one is that this use may happen only in certain special cases. The second one is that this use may not conflict with a normal exploitation of the work. And the final is that this use cannot unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the rights holders. Despite the, despite the importance of the three-step test uh, of the Berne Convention, it is still insufficient in achieving the balance needed in the copyright system. The goal for the working group has therefore been to reflect on the possibilities of a new instrument, which would protect user rights globally. Uh, we believe as a working group that the, this new instrument should consider the existing systems of user rights at the national level. And in our position paper, we therefore identified what are some of the copyright systems uh, which currently exist considering user rights and what are the pros and cons of each of these systems, uh, especially when you think in developing a global user rights system. I would therefore like to give the floor to Jennifer Zirki from the Simon Fraser University, who will briefly analyze the fair use and fair dealing systems. And after that, Deborah DeAngelis and Laura Sinigaglia from CC Italy will go over the civil law and the hybrid systems, as well as over the European experience in creating an international user rights system. Jennifer? Excuse me. Thanks very much, Andre. Um, so to um, give some framework for this discussion, um, a couple of years ago, Tanya Applin and Lionel Bentley um, put forth the proposition that um, the Berne Convention already allows for what they called global mandatory fair use based on the wording around quotation in Berne Article 10.1. Um, they did clarify that the, the quotation exception in Berne would not include every use of copyright protected works that might be covered, for example, by US fair use. Um, but would provide users and should provide users worldwide with a fairly broad right to use copyright protected works in a flexible range of ways. Um, this, of course, as Andre was saying, has not been adopted in uh, different jurisdictions. We still have fairly different approaches to limitations and exceptions. Um, but it was this was one of the things that inspired this working group to start thinking about the elements that might be included in an international instrument to harmonize user rights and how such an instrument might be enacted. So on the next slide. So just for some background, fair use and fair dealing are generally broad exceptions that allow for a wide variety of activities that use copyright protected works. Anyone can take advantage of fair use or fair dealing as opposed to other exceptions and limitations, which in some cases are specific to one sector, education or libraries and archives and so on. Um, fair use in the US model provides suggestions of the types of uses that might be considered fair including things like criticism, news reporting, teaching, but allows for other purposes as well outside of that list. Fair use then also includes four factors to consider to determine whether a specific use is actually fair. And those four factors are considered holistically, meaning that if overall the, the four factors lean towards fairness, the use is fair, even if one or more individual factors are found to be unfair or less fair. The US law, I think, is the best known fair use system, um, but Israel and Singapore also have fair use provisions that are quite similar. And Malaysia has something that is similar, but a little bit more limited. Fair dealing, on the other hand, um, typically provides a closed or limited list of specific purposes that might be considered fair. Um, and fair dealing is limited to those specific purposes, um, but they're similar to those for fair use and include research, education, criticism, news reporting, um, among others. The factors to consider whether determining, uh, when determining whether something is fair might be found in case law or case precedents rather than in the copyright statute itself. For example, I'm in Canada and we have six factors that we consider and these were established in a 2004 Supreme Court of Canada case. Um, though the court also acknowledged that other factors might be relevant, for example, industry standards in the given field. Um, like fair use, in fair dealing, these factors are also considered holistically. So fair dealing comes from the UK or originates from the UK and is therefore mostly seen in common law countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India. Um, now approaches in these countries definitely vary slightly in terms of what are the permitted purposes and the factors used to determine fairness. 
um, but they're, they come from a similar place, so they're generally similar across the board. Both fair use and fair dealing are applied case by case, so each situation's purpose and factors need to be considered anew. Um, though, of course, case precedent and similarities between situations can help with this assessment. Um, so on to the pros and cons on the next slide. Um, fair use and fair dealing can be extremely flexible, which is definitely an advantage. Many different types of activities can fall under those enumerated or suggested purposes, um, generally no matter what sector or industry the user is working within or if they're a member of the general public just working individually or independently. Fair use and fair dealing can therefore keep up with technological change and innovation in a way that more specific exceptions and limitations often can't. Um, and, and this is because they're potentially applicable regardless of the format of the work or the specific type of use. In many cases, fair use and fair dealing um, are also not limited to non-commercial use only, like some of the other exceptions and limitations might be. Um, however, on the next slide, the biggest drawback, drawback of fair use and fair dealing also comes from their open-endedness and their flexibility which can make it daunting for both individuals and organizations to interpret and apply. Going through those factors um, is not always a straightforward population, um, especially for those without legal training or access to legal support. Um, and then the fear of litigation, of course, if they get it wrong, and the numerous fair use and fair dealing court cases in various jurisdictions reinforces this. So this can create a chilling effect and make users of all kinds hesitant to rely on these valuable exceptions. So these are some of the things that um, we would want to think through and kind of grapple with if we if we started to look at um, an international harmonization or approach to harmonization. Um, and with that, I think I'm passing it on to Laura or Deborah. Yeah, to me. Thank you, Jennifer. And hi, everybody. It's a pleasure, of course, to be here and speak about this uh, interesting work that we have done in the last month with the working group number three. Uh, my presentation is about a specific kind of exceptions and limitations, uh, which um, is called the statutory exceptions and limitations that are usually provided for in the civil law systems, which very briefly and in a very simplified way are countries where, that are are primarily based on codified statutes. Uh, so um, in the next few minutes, uh, when I refer to exceptions and limitations to copyright, I mean this specific kind of exceptions and limitations and not uh, the expression in general. Uh, to which we have decided to refer as user as with the broader and I, I think maybe more clear term of user rights uh, as Andre explained before. Um, in the civil law systems, exceptions and limitations to copyright are the most important, the main legal instrument to balance the author's right with the public's fundamental right to access to cultural knowledge. The legislator has identified the specific cases in which the right uh, of the public to access culture and knowledge has to prevail over the interests of authors. And the exclusive rights of authors, uh, of course, the uh, economic rights and not the moral rights in the jurisdiction that recognizes moral rights, are somehow compressed. Uh, so uh, statutory exceptions and limitations are precisely identified by the legislator and cannot be applied in similar cases, but only in those cases uh, that are specifically identified by the law. Um, in the next slide, we are going to find the differences between the definition of exception and the definition of limitation. Uh, exceptions allow under certain conditions the use of the work freely uh, without requesting previous authorization uh, or paying remuneration to the rights holder. Um, and the rights holder cannot oppose this use, uh, of course, if the use complies with the rules stated by law. Uh, the limitations, um, the limitations uh, on the other hand, allow under certain conditions and modalities the use of the work subject to the payment of a fair compensation to the rights holder. Um, therefore, in this case, the exclusive right uh, is transformed into something different from exclusive right in, to a mere right to remuneration. 
So in the first case, there is no need of requesting previous authorization and paying remuneration at all. In the second case, there is the need to pay a remuneration to the right holder. Um, as we have done for the other parts of our report, the, the method that we uh, followed uh, in our uh, report, of course, is to identify pros and cons of each system. So we're going to examine the pros and cons of the system based on uh, statutory exceptions and limitations. Uh, regarding the pros, uh, the first pros is legal certainty. Uh, statutory exceptions and limitations offers you legal uh, certainty to the users. Uh, effectively, they allow uh, all stakeholders to know what is or is not permitted by the law in advance uh, simply by reading the, the text of the law, um, or at least in theory. Um, the second pro is uh, less scope for interpretation because ex statutory exceptions and limitations leave less scope for interpretation than fair use and fair dealing, as they usually explicitly regulate the scope and the modalities of application. And the third pro is the uh, legal clarity because uh, statutory exceptions and limitations are precisely ruled by the law, so they uh, provide legal clarity. Um, in the end, statutory exceptions and limitations are, because they are regulated so precisely by the law, offer more legal certainty and clarity than uh, fair use and fair dealing. But on the other hand, of course, we are going to analyze also the cons of these systems uh, in the next slide. Yes, thank you. The first negative aspect of this kind of systems are the rigidity and the fact that it complicates the encompassing of innovative uses. So uh, this is the, the other side of the coin regarding the certainty. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, since interpretation by analogy is not allowed, um, it may be hard to justify new uses under exceptions and limitations that are established in a completely different environment by the legislator. So if new needs arise, uh, for example, as a result of a technological development, uh, it is not always easy to bring them within the scope of the exceptions and limitations as stated before the, this kind of uh, technological developments. For example, in Italy, we have specific exceptions and limitations provided only for the world before the technological and digital revolution and that are not applicable to new kind of digital uses. So Italy has recently as to update the copyright law uh, with new exceptions and limitations for digital environment uh, within the DSM directive uh, implementation process. Another um, negative aspect is the difficulty in applying exceptions and limitations in common law countries, um, as the legal system of this country is uh, characterized by case law, which is uh, developed by judges through decisions of courts and tribunals. There may be uh, still some uncertainty with very specific exceptions and limitation to the possibility of interpretation by the courts. Um, in the end, a statutory exceptions and limitations are um, more certain than uh, fair use and fair dealing, but less flexible and less able to adapt to the changing of the social and technological environment. And uh, these changes are happening more and more and more often and faster than the past. Um, one last observation I would like to uh, tell you in this presentation is that even uh, in systems based on uh, statutory exceptions and limitations, we will see that um, although certainty is ensured at a national level, um, it can partly fail at the transnational level, as the European experience that Deborah uh, will describe in the next minutes uh, is teaching us. So I think I finished my presentation and I would like to thank you and I'll pass the floor to Deborah. Thank you, Laura. Um, I don't see myself. <laughs> I, I still see Laura, I don't know why. Anyway, I hope everyone can uh, see me. 
and uh, we can um, proceed uh, with uh, the uh, next um, approaches, which is the hybrid approaches. Um, some countries uh, as uh, Taiwan and Australia uh, apply uh, this uh, uh, medium uh, uh, approach, which is uh, an hybrid approach because uh, they combine the openness and the flexibility of fair use with, a, with the statutory exception and limitations. Uh, the countries that uh, adopt this uh, hybrid approach uh, may use both uh, fair use or fair dealing, as well additional specific exception and limitation, such as uh, exception for the glam sector, like libraries, uh, archives, uh, and museums, for criticism, uh, for comments, uh, uh, teaching, scholarship, uh, research, and so on. In addition, uh, some countries of uh, common law tradition that fully apply the uh, fair use doctrine have also codified in specific area, uh, specific exception and limitations in their copyright acts. In addition to uh, fair use or fair dealing, for example, United States uh, that uh, has the tradition of the fair use doctrine has also uh, ruled uh, some specific uh, exception for uh, music uh, performing the right uh, in uh, public venues. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we will uh, examine uh, the pros of this uh, hybrid approach. Um, uh, however, they can raise uh, more uh, uncertainty by uh, creating uh, um, uh, the uh, variety of uh, um, applying the, the, the variety of the interpretation due to the fair use. Um, and uh, exception limitation uh, together, uh, there, there is a, a kind of degree of legal uncertainty for this kind of views. And also there is a, a flexibility typical of the fair use and fair dealing approach. So in this uh, uh, specific uh, scenario, we can take uh, the, the pros uh, of the uh, both system. But however, in the next slide, uh, we will will uh, uh, also uh, see that uh, uh, there are some cons. Uh, in a way, there is an uncertainty by uh, increasing the variety of models, uh, um, causing also a lack of uh, consistencies and clarity across uh, different uh, jurisdictions. Um, and uh, this is, uh, um, in particular, worrisome for the cross-border digital uh, users. Um, so um, we uh, can go uh, pass to the next slide uh, where uh, we focus uh, uh, on the um, European uh, experience, the European model of uh, statutory exceptional limitation. Uh, 20 years ago with the first directive uh, um, InfoSoft Directive on Copyright and Related Rights in the Formation Society, um, the uh, legislator has introduced a series of optional exceptional limit action. Um, Beside the only one mandatory exception for the digital technical copy. Um, only 20 years later, uh, the uh, European lawmaker uh, recognized uh, the uh, gap and the uh, lack of harmonization between the member states due to the optional implementation of the uh, exceptional limitation uh, listed in the InfoSoft directive. So the uh, 
next uh, um, decision was uh, 20 years later with the directive uh, on copyright and uh, related rights in the singular digital market to introduce uh, mandatory exceptions in the area uh, of uh, teaching online uh, digital teaching activities uh, on, in the field of the research uh, in the field of the access uh, of the cultural uh, heritage um, but uh, um, even though uh, we have to uh, plow the uh, EU um, lawmaker for this uh, change of uh, approach, um, we can go um, to the next slide. Uh, there is uh, the, uh, the problem uh, regarding that uh, uh, the uh, directive, uh, um, which is the instrument used by the uh, European legislator to introduce uh, new rules about copyright, um, the nature of the directive is a legislative act that set out, um, out the goals that uh, the lawmaker want to achieve, but at the same time leaves the choice uh, on how to reach uh, them into the national legislature, giving uh, a space, uh, uh, a room of flexibility and discretion to the national legislature. Um, so the problem of this kind of implementation, even in front of mandatory exception and limitation, is that uh, we have uh, a, a global uh, harmonization at the European level, but this reflects uh, on the national legislation like a segmentation of uh, the uh, implementation beside the rules that can be part of the acquis communautaire. Um, so uh, we, we can go... Uh, at the uh, conclusion of my uh, presentation, uh, saying that uh, in a modern uh, connected world, uh, it's necessary to harmonize the system of user rights worldwide uh, to guarantee the effectiveness uh, of the application of the exception and limitation and to permit the exercise of the um, user rights. Uh, so I think I will uh, pass the floor to Andre for the conclusion, and I thank you for uh, your uh, attention. And we are here for uh, any kind of question if arise. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Deborah, for these great presentations. Uh, as we have seen, user rights are essential to protect fundamental rights. Such as, such as the freedom of expression, the rights to information, to education, to culture, especially the, in the modern interconnected world. Uh, in this context of transborder users, of digital users, it is necessary to harmonize the systems of user rights worldwide to guarantee the effectiveness of their application and permit the exercise of such user rights and of the underlying fundamental rights. In building such a global instrument, we have to think on the national implementation of such rights, as shown by the European experience mentioned by Deborah. Ideally, a global mandatory minimum threshold of user rights should be followed by their effective protection at the national level. Uh, each of the three systems we presented here may bring some things to the table. As we have seen, they have each pros and cons. But whichever system is adopted, what is needed from the existing intellectual property organizations is a clear guidance on effective and consistent mandatory user rights, requiring all jurisdictions uh, to implement such rights in a similar fashion. Uh, this implementation and is fundamental so that individuals and organizations working across, working and creating across borders have the legal certainty needed to carry on their activities. And so that fundamental rights, uh, including the rights that I mentioned of freedom of expression, information and culture uh, can be exercised as well as access to culture and et cetera. Uh, building this international system and the national interpretation 
is a key step in restoring the balance between rights holders' interests and the public interests uh, at a global scale. Uh, to that end, we believe that it's not we we it's needed it's necessary to mention and to highlight that user rights have been in the agenda of the SCCR, which is the WIPO Standing Committee for Copyright and Related Rights, for the last 15 years. Uh, during these years, uh, during last year's SCCR 482, the African group proposed a draft program to ensure the preservation activities of GLAMs, which are the galleries, art libraries, archives, and museums, including the transborder uses of preserved materials and uses by people with disabilities. Uh, this proposed by the this proposal by the African group uh, provided some important suggestions to achieve a global harmonization and the committee approved two actions encouraging all the member states to continue negotiating the proposal at the next CCR, SCCR, which is this year in March 2023, in a couple of months. Uh, we believe this uh, these efforts taken in this last SCCR are only a small step forward, but they show that a global harmonization is strongly required from different regions of the world and has to become a common objective of the global, whole global community uh, of copyright. Uh, the SCCR also shows some possible paths forward to achieve this harmonization. Uh, through inclusive and transparent consultation processes and through expert input. Mm. In an ending note, I would like uh, to thank you all for attending this webinar and thank everyone who contributed to this year's position paper. I would also like to thank Brigitte for leading the CC Copyright Platform and my special thanks to Jennifer, Laura and Deborah, without whom this paper wouldn't exist. I believe we can now open the floor for comments or, or questions. Thank you. If you have any, you, I don't know how do we proceed. Usually, Connor, does people raise hands or make questions through the chat? Andre, maybe we can put in the chat the link to the our report yes. on Medium. I'm not sure why I, I'm not managing to open up the the chat maybe uh, because okay. I'm, I'm I'll search for screen. it. I think um, Jennifer did it before, but if someone okay. else uh, just uh, connected later, maybe they didn't, they don't see mm. it. So, yeah. So at, at the moment, it doesn't look like there are any questions in the chat. Um, but if somebody has a question, you're more than welcome to turn on your camera or, okay, there's a question now. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so Jeff Adams asks, are there plans to make specific recommendations to be included in such a global mandate? Uh, uh, so I'll start answering, but Deborah, Laura, and Jennifer, if you have any contributions, please feel free. But we made a choice not to, in our position paper, not to include any specific recommendations. We discussed this if we should, if we should uh, defend a specific system or specific uh, rules in our position paper. But we decided that we should really focus on analyzing the pros and cons and really leading on the on, on mapping out uh, the different systems rather than defending a specific position. It's a really a, co a complex system, and we don't believe uh, a position paper would be would be able to go in depth so that so such a, a depth that we would be feel, feel, feel comfortable to making specific recommendations of a global treaty. I just would like to add that uh, beside our uh, work uh, of the working group on exceptional limitation, uh, we referred also in our report, as uh, Andre said before, to the uh, SCCR at WIPO, where the there are a big effort of all the associations for the civil society 
to uh, support uh, the adoption of a global instrument. Uh, so in that uh, specific uh, uh, contest, uh, uh, there are, uh, for example, specific recommendation that has been uh, um, given by uh, a um, proposed plan uh, from the African group in the last uh, um, uh, SCCR uh, um, meetings. Uh, the new SCCR meetings will be the next March. So in the agenda, uh, it will be discussed these issues as well again. Yes, I, I think that our um, report could be considered as a, as a starting point of the of a broader discussion. So it could be helpful in the in the first step of the of the discussion, or at least it was our our intention. Um, I'll just add that I think um, an organization like WIPO the SCCR is sort of a, a necessary place to have a, more of a conversation from different jurisdictions um, about priorities and about concerns. Um, but I'll also add that last year, this working group, um, I was I didn't participate in this, but the, the working group's position paper um, in 2021 set forward some principles for copyright um, and sort of what priorities it should have or what rights it should encompass. And so that's also something that could feed into how um, an international harmonization might work. Uh, we have a, a hands up, Jane, if you want, you can. Uh... Was your question? Thank you very much. I have no question. Only I want to to thank you for this meeting. It is for me the first time to have this meeting. Thank you very much for this meeting. Uh, I have uh, enough to to tell you, but it's the first time, and uh, I'm from uh, DRC Kinshasa. Thank you, Jean Masangi. Thank you. Hey, thank you, John. It's great, great to have new people here discussing this important issue. Thank you. Anyone else has anything to join? Or Deborah, Laura, Jennifer, do you have any comments you'd like to make on? On the topic or something that would you would like to develop more. Um, otherwise, something that I concerned the SCCR. Uh, I think, uh, as we already mentioned, WIPO is a really important forum for for intellectual property globally, and they are making an increasing effort to include uh, civil society organizations for worldwide. So I don't know if. Uh, we have someone who is not uh, part of CC here, but uh, it is also noteworthy mentioning that WIPO accepts uh, civil society organizations to participate as observers uh, at the SCCR. So if you would like to contribute to this issue in the coming months or in the coming years, uh, it's possible to, if you are, and if you're part of a, an organization, you can apply to become an observer at WIPO and therefore contribute to the topic. Uh, as you mentioned, there, this, this discussion has been taking place in the last for the last fifteen years or so. But here, really, the next year, we we, we have seen it uh, get more attention, and we hope it will hopefully be aggressively get more attention in the coming years. And we hopefully, from the SCCR twenty twenty two, we have some stepping stone to keep on building a global instrument for user rights globally. I have also linked in the chat the position paper for 2021, which Jennifer mentioned. It was the first position paper of this working group. Uh, and it's also on CIS Medium. There was also a webinar, if you want to watch it, uh, for, in which we launched the, this position paper. 
I think it's on CC's YouTube channel. Andre, I think that there are no more questions. So unless I, I give people a few more seconds of the last chance. Doesn't seem to be the case. So um, I think we can uh, bring this webinar to a close with a, a round of applause to all the speakers and the members of the working group who worked a lot to give us a very thorough and clear uh, description of the different ways that user rights are being implemented in, in various jurisdictions across the world. I think um, this is a very valuable resource for those wanting to understand copyright better and how the balance of rights and what we used to call exceptions and limitations in this group, but we now call also user rights, uh, is a fundamental uh, aspect of copyright law. Um, so thank you very much for all your contributions. This uh, webinar will also be published and we'll make sure that um, people can access it for uh, for all their purposes because it's so rich in, in useful information. Um, so once again, thank you, Andre, for leading the group. Thank you, Deborah, Laura, and Jennifer for speaking. And I know other members have also participated or contributed throughout the year. And I want to underscore also their important work. Um, and I think this then concludes our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You. Thank you all. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.